next speaker is um, Pat Hayes. He has BA from Cambridge and a PhD from Edinburgh. He's been in many places. Danny's had two jobs, and as far as I can tell, you've had an infinite number of jobs. No, no, a little bit less. Qualitatively, he's been at academic positions at Essex, at University of Illinois, University of Rochester. He actually had a job at Park. He actually had a job across the street at Schlumberger, at SRI. Um, and I guess you've gone to the other coast. So now he's a senior research scientist at the Florida Institute of Human and Machine Cognition. I always find it hard to say. It's IHMC. Yeah, okay, that, right. IH. Yeah, I know, I know it's IHMC. I actually had to go look at the web and said what IHMC stood for. <laughs> um, the paper of, of, of Pat's that I enjoyed the most it was his original paper on the Naive Physics Manifesto. And it's, you know, he's also a cantankerous. So <laughs> go do your thing. <laughs> but, am I switched on? Oh, yes. Now, you'll notice that I'm even less prepared. I haven't even got a piece of paper. Um, and, and I'm not going to talk about or very much about uh, Danny's uh, scientific achievements because everybody else has done that. And, and anyway, you all know them. So, um, but, but, but I'm going to talk about the way that Danny has sort of been in and out of my life, at least ever since I became a, uh, an academic uh, and, and, and have had a research career, um, in, in all sorts of odd ways. Um, I first met Danny, and in fact, he, he, and I, he reminded me of this a few minutes ago because he was checking this up, and I'd actually forgotten this very first time, but I do remember it now, I think. Um, I was a graduate student at Edinburgh University, which at that time was about the only place in, in one of the few places in Europe, certainly the only place in the UK, that you could go if you were interested in machine intelligence, as it was sometimes called then. Um, and, and, and I was. Uh, I, I decided, uh, uh, having been to Cambridge and taken a math degree, that I definitely wasn't going to be a mathematician. So I better find something else to do, and that seemed the best thing to try. Um, so I was a grad student there, and in a sort of desultory grad studentish, slow European grad studentish sort of way, which meant I was sort of hanging around and earning a little bit of living doing proofreading and bits of programming for people in this state that could go on forever, really. Um, and uh, Danny was a Fulbright star, right? And, and yes, I do remember him now. Actually, I remember this sort of kind of phenomenon, uh, this sort of large, happy, very American, very sort of energetic uh, thing with well-formed opinions that kind of blew through <laughs> and, and left us all saying, what, what was that? What was that? <laughs> um, but I didn't actually have it sort of nailed down as Danny Bobro. It was just that, that, you remember that guy? Yeah, that American, yeah. Him. Um, but he was clearly... Um, a formidable and uh, interesting force. And the next time I had something to do with Danny was, um, I think it was the next time anyway, uh, the next time I remember, was in connection with the AI Journal. This uh, journal of record now with this distinguished, uh, you know, historic record of setting the field to rights. Back in those days, let me tell you, it wasn't the same at all. Um, the problem was to get stuff to put in it. Um, uh, the problem was to uh, persuade the publishers not to throw it out long enough for us to find some stuff for the next issue. That was the sort of state it was in. Now, my association with the AI Journal began because my boss, Vernon Meltzer, was its first uh, co-editor. And... Um, I, I saw how that happened. I was at the meeting. I was a graduate student. I wasn't supposed to be there, but I snuck in the back. All, it was at this thing called the Machine Intelligence Workshop, which um, um, was being a series of meetings that were held at Edinburgh. Donald Mickey, and, uh, bless his heart, had, had um, organized these things and was pulling in important and famous people to these meetings. This was, in those days, the Atlantic was wider than it is now, you understand. It was a much bigger deal across the Atlantic, and there wasn't an internet. Um, and telephone calls cost an arm and a leg, you know. Um, I got my first job to visit Stanford by telegram. Can you believe it? Actually, telegram, a piece of paper. It said, arrive April 1st. <laughs> and it was from John McCarthy. Uh, and I sent a telegram back saying, please confirm. <laughs> but I did. And, and when I did, it was raining. And I thought, damn, that's was a joke. But anyway. Um, so uh, 
All these very important people, uh, uh, very famous people, were packed into this little room uh, to discuss what to do next, how to put the field on the map. And uh, it was generally agreed there should be a journal. Everybody was very enthusiastic. I saw the enthusiasm. And then someone said, well, I guess we need an editor. And it was like watching the room change color from red to blue. <laughs> Every single person in it went <laughs> um, and, and it was a, that was an early lesson for me in the, in the politics of uh, academia. Uh, and and in, uh, Bernard eventually uh, um, was the last person to say, oh, or the first person to say, oh, okay, and the last person to find a way, reason he couldn't do it. So that was how he became editor. But he wasn't, um, he was uh, nearing retirement and he didn't want to do it too long. Um, so, uh, and his co-editor in the, U in the US had uh, also gone on to other things. And yes, there he is. <laughs> And uh, uh, Danny was, uh, I gather, been recruited to replace you, right? Yeah. And uh, I was recruited to replace Bernard. And so Danny and I became the sort of in American and European editors of, or co-editors of this hypothetical journal. Um, so uh, that was great fun um, when we were on the other side, other side of the Atlantic. And, and then I moved to Rochester bringing, as it were, the, the budget of the, um, and, the, and the sort of paperwork of the journal with me, because it was all still being done at Edinburgh. And if I recall, I sort of put it in my suitcase and brought, literally brought it with me. It was, it was a sort of ramshackle operation, I'm afraid. And, um, and then we, while I was at Rochester, Danny and I were still uh, uh, editing the journal, and it, it be began to take on some shape, and we had to have a system for it, which Danny invented to look after the the viewing properly instead of just you know, phoning up my friend and saying, please watch something. Um, and then I moved to here in California, and then I moved to Park. Now remember, I'm supposed to be the European editor. <laughs> so for quite a long time, the American editor and the European editor were running the journal for offices about just on, on one, one block. You know, this building is in blocks, basically. We were at opposite ends of the block running the journal, and it was a very, very productive time for me, a very useful time, because we really could collaborate. And when you're that close to Danny, instead of being, you know, uh, at the other end of a telephone line, um, you really feel the full force of the gentleman. Um, <laughs> uh, and I learned so much about running journals, about dealing with academics, other academics, about, you might call it just sort of being a professional in, in, the, in, the, in the AI world, and I think not just the AI world either, but just the sort of general intellectual world from, from working with Danny in that, in, on that uh, job. Because it, it's a very difficult job running a journal. Um, sometimes you don't get enough papers. You know, it's rather like how an economy. The, the, the publishers expect a certain number of papers per issue on a regular basis. But you get droughts. You get periods where people just don't send you enough stuff and you've got to go out and nag people to write things. Or else you have to have some in stock, a sort of reserve, that have been waiting to be published. But then the, the authors of those papers get a little upset with you by this point. Or the other, but then you get the other opposite phenomenon, where suddenly there's a glut, and there are all these excellent papers. Uh, and by some miracle, the reviewers have reviewed them uh, and agree they should be published, and there isn't enough space in the journal to publish them. And so you have to negotiate with the publisher to have bring out more issues per year, maybe. Perhaps you can make a special issue. We'll invent some topic that will cover some of these papers and we'll call it a special issue. So that's one problem. Another problem is you get loony papers. That's already been mentioned, the ones that Danny used to put on his wall and we would all have a chuckle about. <coughs> and of course, part of the art there is that one really must do one's best to write to the author in a conciliatory way. And sometimes it's possible to try and put them on the right tracks, which requires diplomacy, which Danny has in in, in, and charm, which, which he has in great abundance, and which I, I don't want to say I learned any charm from him, but I certainly learned diplomacy <laughs> from him. Um, but he also has a sort of um, a great forthrightness, a, um, a, 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 an ability to tell it like it is, um, which is also a very healthy attitude, and which I, I did learn from him. Um, and uh, he can make uh, even the most dire situation amusing. 
I can remember a number of occasions in which viewing the situation the journal found itself in, I felt this terrible sort of aching sense of responsibility and near panic about what were we going to do. And all I had to do, I realized, whenever I found that feeling, was go to Danny's office and say, Danny, what are we going to do? He would say, oh, on. And then he would tell me what we were going to do. And it always worked perfectly fine. He never seemed to be worried about things. And he always seemed to find a way to get them to function, which was very, very good. Although I did write an awful lot of letters, now I think about it. Hmm. Um, We could have gone on for uh, forever, I think, doing that, uh, doing that journal. Uh, D Danny, he, he seemed to do it with very little effort. Um, and uh, although he did, I, I, I really don't want to say that, that he didn't do the effort, because he did. He never seemed uh, to be uh, bothered by it, but he, uh, he did the bulk of the, of the work, really, and um, took the major decisions. Uh, and I watched him do that and learn. <laughs> and then, of course, um, an extraordinary thing happened to me. Um, Terry Winograd was actually phoned me when I was at the park. I got a phone call from Terry and he said, Pat, um, we'd like you to be the uh, president elect of the AAAI. I said, well, Terry, you must be insane. Me? You know, I can't do that kind of thing. I'm not an administrative person. Go away and think about it. Can I, 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 you're just crazy. He said, well, I really, we really have thought about it and we really think you'd do a good job. And I said, no, 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 no. He said, well, think, will you, will you, don't just say no now, we'll think about it. And so I thought about it for about three days, and I realized that the most important thing about that wasn't that I, I, mean, I could do it, I didn't want to do it, but I could do it, but that my dad would have been so proud that if I, if I accepted this job, so I did. <laughs> um, which, by the way, Danny, is why I um, insisted that the president be given a plaque to mark their certificate when he died. Um, uh, so I, I, I was then sort of next in line after Danny. And uh, what you're president for, is it two or three years? I forget. Two years, that's right. But you're president elect for two years before that. And you're the sort of past president or the, you know, the old guy for two years after that. So it's really six years of your life that you're going to do this. To me, this is a big deal. I think for Danny, it was like, eh, next job. Do -do -do. Um, <laughs> But um, coming along after Danny was, uh, was um, an interesting experience. Um, there were, uh, I had watched him, as it were, sort of from the sidelines, be the president. And it didn't seem like it was that much work. He seemed to do it cheerfully enough. And then I became the president. And I realized that this was just another case of Danny being able to just do things smilingly and you know with his charm intact uh, that other people would uh, many people would finish up in a small basket weeping after a week of trying to do uh, I managed to be somewhere in between but I got a lot of help from from Danny uh, during my presidency and I he was the sort of person I would go to and say Danny when so and so happened or when something if something else would have, were to have happened what would you have done and I always got very good advice from him and very robust and sensible advice and um, uh, it always worked. Uh, I did what he suggested in almost every case. Um, the, uh, the other thing is, I, 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 I'm talking a bit about me now, not about Danny, but this is important to appreciate the next point. At that time, I was suffering from a, a medical problem, uh, which meant I had, I, I had epilepsy, adult onset epilepsy. I was prone to have seizures. Now, they could be controlled by medication, and, and they were being controlled by medication, but I occasionally would get what are known as petty mal seizures, which means you stand there looking perfectly all right, but something's not right in here. And in my case, it was that I couldn't understand language. I was, I'd be kind of aphasic for a moment or two, sometimes for five or ten minutes, which, you know, in ordinary circumstances, you just become rather quiet until it goes away. But if you're in the middle of giving a lecture, <laughs> in fact, if you're in the middle of giving your presidential address, uh, to an audience which is so big that the people at the back can't even see when you bless them, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, but it's one of the very few times in my life, that is not so good. It's one of the very few times in my life when I had to go up the steps to give the, um, that, that address that I've actually experienced stage fright. Uh, normally I can stand up in front of an arbitrary large number of people and speak ex extemporaneously as I am now doing. And you might not be enjoying it, but I'm having a great time. But <laughs> But um, 
Uh, that particular occasion was terrifying. And I've spoken to other ex-presidents of AAA, and they've all told me much the same thing, that it was a scary uh, moment. Who knows why, but it is. And as I was going up, the, the podium was fairly high, and there was a little flight of steps, as they have, you know, at the back. And I, I'm standing there uh, sweating in new ways. I didn't know human body could sweat. Going up these steps, I get to the top, and I glance around. And just down there, just behind where I was, is Danny looking at me. And I can see that he is more worried than I am. <laughs> and I felt much better. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about Danny, actually, that he really is sort of concerned for people. You know, he was concerned for me. He was worried that I was going to screw that up and be totally intensely embarrassed as a result. And, and I did, and I wasn't, so that was okay. But, um, <laughs> but the main thing is, you know, Danny is sort of protective, I suppose. I mean, we've, we've heard already many times, uh, and I'm sure we're going to hear again and again today about his uh, collaborativeness and his um, almost sort of paternal, actually, although that's not quite the right word, um, although he is older than he looks, you know, um, uh, sort of attitude towards his colleagues. Um, and... Uh, his ability to get involved in their, you know, their, their space, their thinking about their problems, thinking about their issues. Um, and I think that, that all ties in with this sort of, the, the, the same phenomenon was at work there. It's a kind of, a, a kind of extended, an over, uh, um, what's the word, of, um, a hypertrophied um, um, uh, sense of um, empathy, which uh, is what uh, uh, gives Danny his uh, unique character. Now, and I, there's one, I'll, I'll talk about a little before, a little about just one intellectual matter. This doesn't result in accreditation in any way, but um, I, and now I'm going to speak a little uh, as a philosopher, which I have been, uh, amongst other things. I won't claim to be one now. So um, there's a very interesting, essentially philosophical debate, dispute. It's been running on and on and on for many years now in ontology design formalizing knowledge. And the interesting about it is, it, or an interesting about it, is it's got absolutely no psychological importance whatsoever. I mean, it's got nothing to do with cognitive science, but nevertheless, it's very sort of persistent. And it's, um, basically, it's, it goes as follows. There are two points of view, as it were, two perspectives that seem to be formally irreconcilable on how to describe, how to about think about the way the world changes, the dynamic aspect of the everyday world. On one view, um, time is simply a dimension, like, like space, like the spatial dimensions. And um, there are things that are extended in time, you know, because they, they last a while. A and you can think of them, you can think of anything in that, like that, that occupies space and lasts for a while, as being essentially four dimensional, three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension. Or maybe, you know, like the surface of this is two dimensional plus time, so it's three dimensional in a kind of odd way. So it's all a question of really, you might call it a sort of mathematical way of thinking about, or a mathematical way of thinking about how to describe time and change. It has great advantages. It's mathematically very straightforward. It, uh, it ha it, it, in, in, it, from, for formal ontology reasoning, it means that a whole, a whole wide range of different kinds of things and phenomena can all be put under the same heading and reason about it in the same way, and yada, yada, yada. And there are international standards based on it, which are used, for example, by the consortium of petroleum producing industries to describe their, um, their big ontologies they use to coordinate things like, um, oh, it is Uber. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, the, uh, scheduling of maintenance for the plants and so forth. So that's one point of view, often called the 4D view. Another point of view is that there's a fundamental difference between something that's sort of extended in time, like a kind of process or an event, you know, like, or like this talk, which as you know is extended in time, because I see somebody's yawning already, okay, um, and can be sort of divided, call it as happening and processes, or process of some kind on the one hand, and sort of solid things that last, but at any given moment are what they are. Like, you know, chairs and buildings and desks and people, right? And, and the latter are called <coughs> continuance in this perspective, because they 
are three-dimensional. I mean, I am, I'm here, I'm me, I'm all, all, I'm all here now. I don't have any parts missing. But I'm sort of going through time, like a sort of passenger on a boat or a boat going along the river, right? Uh, um, and I'm the same thing from day to day. Of course, my properties change. I get a little older. I, you know, my memory of things 30 years ago is not as good as it was when they were 20 years ago. These things change, but I, me, are in the same thing. And this chair, as it's, as it's um, what is this stuff anyway? This, this fabric fades, you know, or becomes a little greasier or whatever, or as the, the plywood gets chipped, remains the same chair with its properties changing. So on this second point of view, continuance, as these things are called, that continue through time, and uh, occurrence or events, are fundamentally different. And a lot of the ontologies that are based on natural language out there, things like Dolce, which is another kind of standard that we heard a lot about, or perhaps you didn't, but I did at one of the, uh, the, the uh, spring symposia this morning, uh, an Italian ontology that's widely used in the biological sciences, is firmly based on this distinction. It's a sort of categorical distinction. Now, I've been a firm proponent, that's more than a firm, a pioneering pro proponent of the 4D view, the clean mathematical view or way of doing ontology anyway, for some years now. And one of my most recent purely intellectual fracas with Danny Barbara was a time recently at a meeting when he and Chris Welty accosted me, I think is the only way to put it. Um, <laughs> they came to me, as it were, from one on each side, so I couldn't get away. <laughs> and basically, with a sort of an air of almost disbelief, asked me how I could possibly believe this nonsense, right? Because uh, it was surely obvious that this other point of view was the right way to do things. This was in the context of a, a ICRIS project that we were both involved in a few years ago. And I said, well, pff, it's obvious to me, yada, yada. And we went back and forth, as, as people tend to do over this issue, by the way. This has been being argued about with passion on both sides now for the last 30 years or more, certainly at least, probably more. And no one, no one changes their point of view. It's, it's absolutely, it's, it's like Catholicism and Islam or something. You know, I mean, they just don't change. And, and afterwards, after this little um, argy bargy we had there, I, I went away thinking to myself, how can Danny, I mean, of all the people I know, how can someone this smart and this sort of, this sort of cosmopolitan in his thinking, who's contributed so much to so many different fields, how can he be so stuck? in this narrow point of view, this is sort of clearly faulty perspective, <laughs> right? Why can't he sort of cast away these, these sort of strange habits of thought that are limiting him and, and see the elegance and beauty of this picture? And then I, it occurred to me, why not? And of course, it's because the first continuance you think of when you come to believe this continuance is yourself. We all do that, right? And so Danny is saying to himself, am I a 4D sort of worm passing through time that you can take temporal slices of? Or am I, well, me? Am I here now? And am I the same person now as tomorrow, or you know, 10 years from now, or 20 years in the past? Am I the same Danny Bubber? And his answer to himself is, I'm sure, well, yes. And he's right. <laughs> Philosophically, he's wrong, but he's right about that. <laughs> Um, the, the, probably the, uh, Danny is the one, pr the person of all the people I know, I think I could say that Danny is the one who is most clearly himself uh, at every stage, at it, it, every time slice of him I have been acquainted with, to speak in my way, <laughs> uh, <laughs> has clearly been a slice of the same person. And he's going to go on being the same person, as far as I can see, until he, uh, well, you know, until he's not the person anymore at all. But that, that, that'll ha that won't happen until long after I'm not, so I'm sure. So, um, yeah, um, it's your, I wish you were a phenomenon, Danny, but you really are the same person, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really all I've got to say. I'm sorry I haven't taken a bit of time. <laughs> but hmm? Pat, Pat, I have one question for you. So <laughs> you're, about 4D, you're go away. <laughs> when you were in that meeting that founded the AI journal, yeah. who was the person who made the decision to give the evil Dutch publisher the ownership of the term artificial intelligence? Uh, that had decision had already been made. 
Oh, um, oh yeah, so, um, so you're not responsible for that. No, and I, you know, I know how it happened, uh, because basically we had to have a, a publisher of scientific journals, right? For because um, um, for financial reasons, it had to be in Europe, right? um, as I recall. And Bernard, bless his heart, wrote to the three major ones, and North Holland was the only one he got an answer from. It's that simple. And North Holland negotiated the ownership. Oh, I, that that time it probably wasn't considered. It was ownership of the of the of the name was probably something that you know wasn't considered important a deal. Oh. It certainly cost us endless hours later. Oh, I know. Well, time change, you know. <laughs> the movies. Okay.